It's my pleasure to, this evening to introduce um, uh, Secretary, he was the Under Secretary of the Navy, uh, uh, Jerry Holton. Uh, Mr. Holton is a native of Ohio, graduated from Ohio State University, and while at Ohio State, he was in the Naval ROTC program. Uh, he spent some time in the Navy on active duty. After he did his active duty in the Navy, uh, he went to Yale Law School and graduated with a degree from Yale Law School. He was in the same class with Bill and Hillary Clinton. After uh, law school, he went back to Ohio and practiced law, uh, very successful practices in Ohio. Uh, and then um, uh, Bill Clinton was elected president and he reached out to Secretary Holton and asked Secretary Holton to come to DC. Uh, initially, Secretary Holton uh, served on the CNO's executive panel and then he was nominated and confirmed as the Under Secretary of the Navy and served as the Under Secretary of the Navy uh, 1998 through 2000, as I recall. Uh, 2000 arrives, uh, the Bush administration takes over, and Secretary Holton uh, uh, moves north uh, to Hoboken, New Jersey, uh, to the Stevens Institute of Technology, where he was the dean of the business school. Uh, after his stint as dean of the business school at the Stevens Institute, uh, he did move across the river to uh, Brooklyn and became the president of Brooklyn Polytechnic Institute. And uh, while he was the president of Brooklyn Polytechnic, uh, he orchestrated the merger of Brooklyn Polytechnic with NYU with New York University. And it's the consulting that he's done since that he's going to talk with us about tonight. And it was consulting with most of the major cities in the world. And I, I know from experience that prior to the pandemic, this fellow almost lived aboard an airplane flying around the world. And it's uh, that experience that he's going to chat with us tonight. It is my honor and my pleasure to ask you to join me in greeting Secretary Holton. Well, thank you, Robbie. It's good to be here. Uh, I do owe Robbie a uh, piece of my career and I want to thank him for that he made a key introduction that led to me being undersecretary so thank you Robbie the um, so how many of you watched Ted Lasso oh a few okay well Ted Lasso is a series on streaming video now and in it Ted Lasso who's a soccer coach but he's in a lot of incidents oh and he has a line which I want you to keep your eye on which is uh, be curious, not judgmental. So hold that thought. Because I'm going to ask you to be curious tonight and not judgmental about what I have to say. Because it could be easy to be judgmental about a good bit of what I say. Curiosity will be tougher. So uh, I want to talk a little bit about how the virtual world is shaping the physical world. So there's virtual, streaming video, all the things we do, and it's changing the physical world. I want to show you how that's happening. The, uh, but you might wonder, well, what has this got to do with foreign affairs? But I think by the time I'm done, you will see the connection. But that may be, again, take some curiosity on your part to understand that. But before I uh, dig into this, three stories. First, Robbie said I was in the Gulf of Tonkin. I think that's a good example of where someone, the president in this case, Lyndon Johnson, was judgmental and not very curious. Remember, he thought an incident occurred. He wanted an incident to, to occur, and he said, let's have war. Well, I want to tell you, that night, I'm only two months in ensign, so how do I know? But I'm in CIC watching, listening to the Maddox and the Turner Joy as they shout about what's happening and start screaming that they're under attack. And the chiefs, 
who've been in the Navy for years, say they're not under attack. They're following their rudder wake. Every time they flip the rudder, it creates a whirlpool. They think that's a torpedo, and they think they're under attack. So it was another night for me. I went to bed. Three weeks later, Time Magazine arrives, says Johnson declares war on the Gulf of Tonkin incident. We all said, well, that was the night nothing happened. But they never ask us, not, certainly not a young ensign. And I wasn't about to raise my hand and say, I didn't think it happened, Mr. President, that night. I won't jump ahead and tell the other story, but I did run into Robert McNamara in the White House one day, and I asked him. And we had a long discussion about that. So that's another story for another speech. Well, that's where judgment prevails. Now let's talk about curiosity. So that was 1964. 1965, I'm in Hong Kong. And I say to the executive officer, what could I do in Hong Kong? He says, well, you want you to do is take the train out to the new territories. This is undeveloped China. So yeah, that sounds fun. So I put on my civvies, take a camera, hop on the train, figure when that gets, everyone gets off, I'll get off. One mistake. My curiosity just about got me a prisoner in China for years. Because remember, Robert Downey was a pilot. He got shot down. He was a prisoner for 20 years. Well, the train goes up to the border, but it goes through because the villagers live on the other side. So now I'm in China. The guards got machine guns. I say I'll jump. Well, the train turned around. I came out. I'm here. So obviously, I wasn't a prisoner for 20 years. But curiosity about got me. Now, about five years ago, I meet one of my graduates, head of a big company in Taiwan, and he's friends of Xi Jinping, the head of China. He tells me this story. He says when Xi Jinping was the governor of Fujian, that's the province right across from Taiwan, they were doing a lot of business. They were friends. They went to Pearl Harbor. They went to Hawaii. And in Hawaii, a big storm came through, and while they were driving around, they got totally lost. And before they realized it, their curiosity had put them inside the gate of the Naval Air Station in Pearl Harbor. So Xi Jinping's been curious about <laughs> our defense system in a very interesting way. So three stories is sort of fun, but let's dig into the meat of what I want to talk about tonight. First, let's talk about cities. The digital and virtual world, I'm going to argue, is changing the physical qualities of our cities. And think about it. Just take an easy example. Telemedicine and working from home. All right? Suddenly, the freeways we built for everyone driving to the center city are about half capacity. Suddenly, I'm not going to doctors. I'm saving two hours a day. So the physical world's already starting to shift. And if we stay in this mode, we'll decide we do not need as many roads as we have, certainly not the capacity. But there's other ways. Uh, Uber and Lyft basically opened up the opportunity for transportation for any number of people for whom the taxi system didn't work and the buses didn't come by. But secondly, the data from Uber began to show that bus systems that where people wanted to go and where they were when they needed transportation wasn't where buses were. So suddenly, New York City, after 25 years of never changing its bus routes, says, wow, we're not close to where people want to be, and they changed the bus routes. So think of that, a better city based on data, based on the virtual world, essentially Uber getting you up on a cell phone and bringing you a car. So this metaphor is going to show up more and more, I think, in our future, and I'll tell you why. There's other ways the virtual world's showing up. In Columbus, Ohio, where I now live, they've created a system for automatically approving building permits. 95% of building permits are simple. And a machine can approve them. The 5% are hard. People ought to do that. So suddenly they are able to get rid of a good bit of customer service staff that used to help you fill out the form and say how it works. And secondly, they began to uh, get better results, quicker results, so people remember time in construction is cost. And if it takes you six months to get a permit, that's six months where you own the land and have no revenue. If you can do that permit in a day, now your world is a better world. And they cut the staff enormously. So now I go to Kazakhstan, 
we'd say Kazakhstan, what's happening there? And I meet a construction company that has digitized everything from buying the land, 25 processes, how to build the building, how to sell the building, how to choose the paint in the apartment. It digitized it all using 300 young Russian engineers. It's the best construction operation that I've ever seen. No American company can match that today. So here's Kazakhstan, where we think it's behind, it's Central Asia, what could be happening there, and it's better than we are. So that then leads to a reduction in theft, a reduction in wage theft, a reduction in bribery, because they're tracking so much they can see when someone's paying a person and they're not working. Now in Brooklyn, there's a young lady, Israeli, who's worked out how to use virtual reality, Oculus, to allow you in a new development, let's say in your neighborhood, they're gonna build a new building, allow you to look at, well, how would that building look? And how would it look if you say, I'd like to see it be shorter? Let's see it shorter. So she's being hired around the nation to help cities engage their citizens or to help companies build a better product. So you see this virtual world showing up in better design, changing what's happening in cities. Now in Helsinki, wants to be the most functional city in the world. That's their, that's their strategy. One of the neighborhoods called Kalalastama decides what they're gonna do is save one hour of wasted time a day for every citizen. So think about that. So a lot of smart city stuff sounds like it. big data up there, they're crunching it, supercomputers, what's it got to do with me? But if you flip the metaphor and say, what is a wasted hour you'd like to get rid of? Pick one. I asked a woman there, she said, I don't like to cook dinner. I'd like to be able to have dinner delivered, okay? Most of us think of waiting for the bus. That's a good one. But soon you begin to deliver goods for people based on this sort of virtual capacity that didn't happen in the past. Now Paris has begun a project they call the 15-minute neighborhood. How many people have heard about the 15-minute neighborhood? One, good. Well, I'll introduce you to something new. So here's the idea. Within 15 minutes, everything that you need should be walkable or bikeable. So that basically you quit driving so much and you leave your, you, most of your life in a nice 15-minute zone. You educate your kids, you go to work, you buy your groceries, you have your uh, entertainment and your exercise all within 15 minutes. And this is beginning to show up in America. Uh, well, first I'm gonna to go to Saudi Arabia. It's showing up in Saudi Arabia in a new city called Neom. Neom, you'll love this design. A hundred miles long, like a string, and on it are just little pearls, so that every neighborhood on that hundred mile track, uh, track is a high speed uh, train system, you're within five minutes of everything that matters. So instead of the way we build our cities, center, you're out in the suburbs, 20 minutes to get downtown or whatever, you're basically always near downtown. And if you want to travel to another part, hop on the train and you're there in no time. So a totally different model of the city. Uh, so it's showing up in terms of delivering people a better quality of life, using technology and using design. I don't want to make this a technology speech. It's almost a design speech at times. How do we make things look or feel or work? Technology is a, an aid. There's a young venture capitalist in Phoenix, and here's what he's doing. He's building a neighborhood, 750 homes, where you can't have a car. Now this is in Phoenix where you have to have a car, but his view is, the neighborhood has no cars. Now parked on the side are 160 electric vehicles. So you can rent one, you can walk over and drive into town and you bring it back and park it. Or there's bikes or there's a light rail system. But he's creating again this 15 minute neighborhood because in this development is daycare, a restaurant, groceries, exercise, co-working space. So for most people, they're going to move there and live their, 15, their life on that 15-minute plot. So you'll see this begin to show up. I've seen it in the cities across America, and as I say, Paris led the way. 
So Robbie wanted me to highlight a few of the things I've seen in cities around the world. I'm going to fly through this pretty fast because I want to get to the Q&A and other pieces I want to talk about. But let's talk about some cities. You saw the map of all the places I've been. So the lead city is Singapore. There's no question. They think about the future. They ask what is needed, and then they build what is needed for their people to be successful and competitive in the world. It's just a fantastic system. You can argue about the political well. You'd say it's not really free. But boy, you feel pretty free there in terms of who I am and get to do what I want to do. Next would be, I have to put Shanghai on the line, and really 300 cities in China that they build as smart cities. China uses technology. They, they've done lots with cities to do connectivity, to use 5G. They made a big mistake, in my view. They built their cities on the hub-and-spoke model of the U.S., and that's not a very good model. It's car dependent, it's full of congestion, and it's not the they I bet you they wish they could back up and do it over again, but you can't. Uh, Malaysia, I chair the Smart City Alliance in Malaysia. Malaysia, like Singapore, they always want to catch up with Singapore, that thinks about the future, creates it like a strategy for Industry 4.0, thinks about smart cities, creates a strategy for smart cities, and then does it. Uh, the Southeast Asian countries are, are really great at this, as is South Korea. South Korea has a city that's basically digitized every operation. Uh, where else? Kazakhstan again, Nur Sultan. Now there's where we begin to see problems. A new city built from the ground up, it doesn't work. They, they don't know how, you don't know how, we don't know how to create that kind of vibrancy that you feel here in Baltimore, or we feel in DC, or we feel in New York. Uh, that takes some time, as uh, Senator Moynihan said, the way to make a great city, two universities, wait a, a 200 years. So, so, okay, so we have a problem with new cities, and we see that around the world. The UAE, Dubai, they want to be the happiest city in the world, but phew, would you live there? Maybe, if you're really rich. Uh, Abu Dhabi, a little better. Abu Dhabi is innovative. It's got more texture to it. It's got, you know, they brought in a lot of art in terms of giving you a culture. Uh, Mazdar City, this was a fresh up from the ground city, a failure. Some nice experiments, but it didn't come close to being a city. Uh, now I'm going to go to Moscow. Now Moscow, right by Red Square, they built a fabulous park. Probably, the, in my view, the, one of the best parks in the world. It has got uh, basically rolls down to the river. It's just well designed. Americans designed it. And it engages people in a, just a fabulous way. Built in opera, buildings built in by the uh, Iraqi uh, uh, architect who recently died. Uh, it's, it's really great. Overall, is Russia a smart place? Not too smart, although one day in walks, I'm in a conference like you are here, in walks Putin and reads a fabulous speech on smart cities, better than any smart city speech I've heard an American give, American mayor give. But when I get done, I have a young school teacher, uh, sweet blonde beside me, she whispers in my ear, that really wasn't Putin, that was a double standing in for him. So whether Putin knows about smart cities, I'm not sure, but his double does. Now, uh, let's go to Israel, startup nation. They understand Tel Aviv, a lot of this, what I've been describing going on. So a, a great city. I've talked about Helsinki, I won't repeat it, Stockholm, lots of interesting things. Neighborhoods which are going very green using technology. Uh, I saw one system where uh, they're basically creating three uh, sources of water, so they're taking what they call black water and they get rid of it, and they gray water, recycle it, and clean water they use. So we can't replumb America, but you could replumb some neighborhoods. Or like in Tempe, they could do this in a new project. Uh, Barcelona, everyone talks about Barcelona, and they should. Barcelona really moved from technology as the force to people. What's in it for people? And they make the technology do it. And I chaired the Smart City uh, Expo there for a number of years, and I have to say, the people sort of rose up and said, we don't want tech, we want a quality of life. And it continues to go on. And if you get a chance, go to Barcelona. That will be a 
great opportunity. In some ways, you never see the smart. What you see is I just feel good about how things work. Things move. Things are where I want them. Uh, Portugal, there's a neighborhood ca called Kashkash. They manage their transportation so well, they save so much money, they could give their citizens free bus transportation. Tourists still pay, but the citizens don't. Uh, London, congestion pricing, you've heard other things, a lot of use of technology. New York City, where I just came from today, they did wireless water meters. That sounds pretty mundane, right? Two interesting things. It cut down water loss enormously, because you detected right away if you were an owner of a building, I'm losing water, the bill's going up. And two, they got rid of complaints because people immediately saw they had a problem, they fixed it. Instead of six months later when the bill came and said, my God, I've been leaking water for six months and I owe you $1,000, I don't want to pay. So that, that's interesting. And the company that won that contract, 2014, someone bought it, $150 million. 2017, that someone sold it, 1.1 billion. So you can see, smart city might be worth looking at in terms of a technology investment. Oh, what else has New York City done? They've created a lot of bike lanes where they're totally protected, where they move the parking out into the street so that the bike lane is buffered from moving traffic. Not like, by the way, Guilford Avenue that I just drove down has got the bike lane right down the center of the road as though you're going to ride your bike down the center of a three-lane thoroughfare. That's not a bike lane. That's a death lane. So, so they've done good in New York on this. Uh, they created advertising kiosks, going to pay for themselves. They fought, lost millions of dollars. So not every story I'm going to tell you is a positive story, and not every city is doing a great job. Uh, but New York does a lot of great things, and certainly like uh, someone like Singapore thinks about the future, plots the future, and then tries to do it. Uh, Columbus, Ohio, where I came, come from, they won the $50 million smart transportation grant from the U.S. government. They used it to try to do more electrical vehicles. My report would be they spent a lot of money, didn't get much results. Uh, they made a dent, but really didn't get a change. There are now shuttles being used to... Uh, in, in poor neighborhoods to move let people get to the grocery store or get delivery of goods but you would say dollar for donuts they're spending way too much money for the little benefit there's more to be done I, and that will show up other places chicago by the way though rahm emanuel uh, used led lights to cut down energy costs and reportedly save 10 million dollars a year in energy bills so 100 million dollars over the course of the product so that's pretty good and then you put up on these new street lights, an ozone detector, or a camera for recording accidents, or any number of things. So Chicago's done well. Phoenix is pretty cool. Uh, Phoenix has 22 governments. They've all created a consortium. So they now work together on what's smart. ASU, Arizona State, is a very, uh, it's a little bit like how uh, Habrowski did the, the U, UBMC, right, UMBC. Uh, which was, he said, I owe it to give you access, and I owe my community to give your economy energy. So most universities, I want to be first in research. Uh, later on, the research shows up. More universities we're seeing are saying, no, I need to change the community, and they've done a good job in Arizona. More to come. Now, there's a lot of things you can do with smart cities. Uh, you're probably thinking of them. I'm going to run through the list real fast. Uh, you can... Hang on a second. I've talked about wireless water meters, building permits, zoning permits. Zoning's going 3D. They digitize it. You're going to do zoning. You can see it all in 3D. You can see where the shadows are, all that kind of work. Uh, RFP management in terms of buying things. Uh, the metaverse, I'm going to talk about more. South Korean city put itself on the metaverse. Uh, micro mobility, the use of lift and scooters and seeing where people really want to go. Uh, pedestrian safety, a big issue uh, in many cities. And you can use data uh, nowadays, LIDAR and other things to find out where the near misses are and begin to design the intersection so you don't have accidents at all because you prevented even the near misses. Uh, parking systems, uh, food systems, uh, 
vertical farming. Uh, there's new farming now that basically farm in a building, you use 100 times less water than agricultural farming. So you're gonna see urban farming. You, I buy my lettuce in New York City, it's grown in Brooklyn. I buy my lettuce in Columbus, Ohio, it's grown in Columbus in a building. It is fresher and it's cleaner. Uh, video cameras everywhere, mixed bag, right? Uh, police body cameras, 47% of the police forces in America in 2016 had video cameras. And think of how many times now we've discovered how much racial injustice there is in our criminal system that we always used to have to be he said, she said, and we'd always go with the police and it would be a lost case. That's changed, that's dramatic. It's not over yet, but it's dramatic. Uh, microgrids, I won't go into in detail, but get your power closer, be less vulnerable to big power outages. Uh, remote work systems, Zoom, Slack, and think of it, those systems, again, changing the physical world. I mean, how many times do we not go to a meeting now because we just do it on Zoom? Uh, some days, I'd like to have a meeting in person, today, but not every day. Uh, digital twins, who knows what a digital twin is? We got some, yeah. So basically, you create a total digital uh, match of, let's say, this building. And nowadays, you do it as it's being built, so you know what's behind the walls, and you record that. So you just save it. And when there's a modification to be done to the building, get out the digital twin, look for what pipes are there, cut the hole in the wall in the right place, it all works. You can do this in shipyards to reorient the shipyards, the Navy's doing that. Uh, Chicago's signed a big contract to do this. Uh, you're gonna see digital twins show up lots of places. Keep your eye on that. Uh, Virtual reality, I told you about the young woman using it to help design uh, cities, telemedicine, covered that, but public health, it's showing up more often, detecting flus, understanding how you know something's beginning to move in a school, catch it right away. Uh, mental health, a lot of use of broadband and the internet to provide mental health services. And you're seeing, you know, you see it on a billboard, you know, basically call this number or get up on this uh, place, and they're doing the consulting at a distance. Uh, India in a, in a, uh, issued a digital ID and then they handed out all their welfare benefits to a largely poor country directly to the recipient. Cut out the middleman. Suddenly the bribery and the theft going on, zip. Uh, facial recognition, mixed bag, but we'll get better at it so it doesn't have racial bias and it can provide a lot of, a lot of benefits. Shot spotter, acoustic detection of gunshots. Who's heard about that? Yep, that's more often. Uh, the, uh, there's noise monitoring going on, so we're beginning to try to understand what noise is, because cities are full of noise, not very helpful for lots of reasons. Building heat sensors to tell whether a building's leaking energy and then beginning to force the owner to do retrofits. Uh, and some cities now are issuing a database of all the checks they issue so that you can see uh, who's getting the money, who's maybe getting too much money, who's not getting the money. You can do an analysis of our small businesses getting. So there's all kinds of ways that smart city use of data is showing up. And it's not always the city buying something. It's things happening that use data. Well, enough with that. I. I think that in cities, first I'd say uh, we're gonna live in cities more and more and they're very productive. 70% of people live, will live in cities, about 80% of GDP from cities. So they're worth investing in. Two, design combined with technology, I do think can have a lot of impact. That's the 15 minute city idea. And three, uh, I think you can see that there could be problems. This is an open door for cybercrime. This is a big issue with privacy, uh, and it makes us vulnerable to uh, our enemies because it's a very it's a penetrable system by a savvy adversary. So I don't want to paint a picture that it's all just roses, but it's gonna happen and we need to deal with those issues. Secondly, I wanna talk briefly about work. Uh, we, for the last couple hundred years, since the Industrial Revolution, have uh, all had jobs 
the sort of eight to five, and that's the model, and we get trained and educated to do those jobs. And a lot of them are physical, a lot of them don't require a lot of mental skills, and therefore we could have an education system that pretty much failed for about half the kids that went to high school. Uh, don't worry whether you can really think, because you'll be a truck driver. Uh, don't worry about whether you can really think you can be whatever. Uh, that system's going away, because robots, and I don't just mean you know, the walking robot, I mean automation, AI, robotic systems, smart systems are just gonna eat and eat and eat into what we call work. And why not? 24 hours a day on the job, not eight hours as humans. No strikes, no tears when grandmother dies and I have to take a week off. I mean, th it's a very appealing alternative. Uh, it's not too good for us unless we learn to educate all of us to be smarter than robots. So interestingly, my view on work is gonna change our lives is there's a big plus. The plus is we could produce enough goods by these automated systems that we could have probably all we want. And we, if we could figure out a way to hand it out that didn't make you feel like it was welfare, it might be a pretty nice system. I often say the rich don't really work eight to five. They think they have a good life, they go places. Well, why couldn't all of us live that way? So that's on the horizon, but it really undercuts all of our values about who we are. Our jobs almost define us. I just sat down with my young friend here. First question, what do you do, <laughs> right? You know, what we do is who we are. So this is, this is a future that has enormous potential, but it also requires an enormous shift in, in how we live our lives. And you're seeing work already eating away at jobs. Uh, senior housing, well, there's a social robot. So you have a little cuddly, it kind of talks to you. So you don't need to someone to come in and take care of you. They, they're getting smarter and smarter about that. Uh, I've talked about automated permits, food production, healthcare, mobility, autonomous vehicles soon and be more and more important. Uh, wireless water meters, I covered that. Uh, accounting, using blockchain and other systems. Uh, K-12 education going virtual so that you're using potentially fewer teachers, although it's not the case today. And there's something out called GPT-3, which is, I call it IBM's Watson, except on steroids and reportedly good enough that it can detect in a mass of, let's say, uh, consumer calls to uh, Amazon, the emotional content of those calls and signal where the anxiety is and what's going wrong. It's that sophisticated. Or it can take data and essentially turn it into a report and you think, and it's as good as a human could write. So we're walking right up to the things you and I probably think are, well, we'll never take my job because I use my brain all the time. That's not gonna be the case. Uh, so being smart will be pretty important. And I say the education system is 100 years without advance. Now, you may argue there's been some advance, there has. I remember I've been a university president. But we basically use a one teacher and 20 students model and we think that's the penultimate. Now, if you go to India and try to do one teacher for 20 students, you got more teachers than India will ever educate. And if you thought the world deserved a good education, you can't create enough teachers to educate it about what, two billion kids below 20. To educate those kids the way we do now and give every one of them the education you got, you can't do that with two and uh, one and 20. You've got to come up with some new system. Uh, so I, I lay work, robots, we could have a great life. We better get well educated or we'll fall out of this picture. Finally, I want to talk about something that's kind of fun, the metaverse. So first, I, sent an, I gave you an article on the metaverse. So you can read it later to see what it is. It's a good article. The Times did well. Uh, basically, what used to be electronic games huge industry, lots of kids on it, has morphed into cryptocurrencies, has morphed into virtual reality, Oculus, 
And all of that is heading to a point where you can create a world that feels very real, that's all virtual, all digital. And these worlds are already being created. There's a government in South Korea that basically took everything in the city and made it virtual. So uh, it's quite powerful. Now secondly, once you get into the metaverse, young people are creating what are called DAOs, D-A-O. And a DAO is a decentralized autonomous organization. And the, you basically create your own rules, your own maybe currency, your own uh, criminal justice system, and you live in that world. Now, the appeal of that is, if you're in a country that has a rather rotten system, that may be a pretty appealing place to spend a good bit of your life. It may be more creative. And soon, we're going to see people doing work in that world. It's not a big jump to imagine that programmers around the world will work in a virtual world because they can kind of walk around, talk to each other, see each other, where you're in London. I got a question of when you sleep. But that world is going to begin to really captivate people and it will begin to walk its way back down to the physical world and here's where I think we get to foreign affairs because as you create a world that's so appealing in the virtual metaverse you begin to say well why is my nation state not delivering the goods for me let's take climate change you could have a virtual world of climate change advocates all saying we want to happen. It might be, it might be basically 60% of the world. And yet when they come out of the virtual world and come back to the physical world, they got countries that can't figure out how to come to agreement. Because the nation state thing is a problem in the sense that you got to compete. You got to worry about your boundaries. You got to bear, they may attack you. And that world's going to get challenged. I don't quite know how, and I'm saying be curious about this because it's coming, and the question is do we shape it? Do we help uh, use it? For instance, I think, I think now that we could begin to do social experiments in a kind of way, you know, we can argue Stalin and the Russian communists did a big social exper experiment. It's a pretty rugged experiment. Does communism work? It kill a lot of people, a lot of people live in poverty, et cetera. You might be able to do that on the multiverse and not end up with 80 years of tragedy. Maybe you could have tested the US slavery system and said, not that good a system. It doesn't really produce the end we want and get rid of some of those years of living a, a rotten system. Uh, or Mao's cultural revolution. You know, maybe Mao could have gamed it out on the metaverse and said, whoa, that does not get me the ends I was after. So I think I'll skip it. And maybe then, what was the number? How many people died? 10 million, 100 million is an enormous number. So the metaverse is pretty powerful. Uh, the I'm reaching the end, and I want to be sure I cover the final points. So let me start about where I or end where I began, which is Ted Lasso's view, be curious, not judgmental. Uh, and I'd like to think when I was in Viet in, in the South China Sea, they, they really the, the uh, charts weren't very good. And what we had to do to sail was essentially I had to shoot the stars, navigate by the stars, which is not that precise. And then we put a sailor on the bow of the ship and his or her job, his in those days job, was to look for white water because white water meant there were rocks, you know, water going over rocks. That was a tip off that we may be in trouble. So it's, it's pretty ambiguous. So you couldn't be judgmental and say, boss, captain, I know right where we're at. You had to say, be a little more curious. I think I know where I'm at, and I'm going to keep paying attention to what's happening. Well, let's be curious about this future. 
Uh, there's a couple ways to do it. Uh, one is we can do a lot in our cities to make life better, to improve the quality of life, to take out wasted hours of your day. That would be worth a little curious exploration. Second, robots are clearly accelerating, and all the robots in the big sense of the word, what's going on uh, with work. And we need to be curious about how we would educate and how we live our lives and how we would enjoy the product that this technology gives us. And if Robbie's right, you'll get it in the next speech, technology is going to blossom. And it's going to blossom down the lines I described, I can assure you. Finally, uh, virtual realities, uh, especially for the young, giving them a new way of living their lives. There are a lot of kids in the Philippines essentially making their lives on the metaverse. They are trading NFTs. They are trading, doing work. They are creating avatars and making enough money to be b better paid than if they worked in the physical world. So you're going to see this shift up to the metaverse as an attractive place to live your life, a good bit of your life. You've got to come back and eat got to sleep I realize but a lot of your life can be up there and finally the proposition I think for us as policymakers is the metaverse gives us a place to have extremely large simulations or games of new ways for society to work and this could be a great way to find out whether uh, universal basic income pays off let it let people live in that world for a while and see how they do. Uh, other things like that, that I think could be very helpful to how we create the future. So finally, I would say you can imagine this virtual world sweeping over us, or you can imagine we take charge of how we create this virtual world and live in it. And that's gonna take a lot of curiosity, I can assure you, and less judgment. So. Uh, for me, we've got a chance for a better world, better cities, better work, a better life. It's gonna take some curiosity to make that happen. So thank you for your time. And I love to have Q&A because I'm sure you don't all agree with me. And I'd like to hear what the discussion is. Thank you very much. Is this working? I think it's working. Okay, who has the first question? So I'm going to bring the microphone to you, sir. So you're familiar with China's system, and you're familiar with Singapore's, mm -hmm. and you're familiar with China's social capital plans. Do you see any signs that Singapore is moving in the same direction? Uh, well, some. The you know the prior leader of Singapore seemed to be an enlightened uh, autocratic leader. And he, he seemed to know how to balance, leaving people enough room to be feel free at least, primarily. Uh, they've moved now to second generation leadership and sometimes that's less uh, agile. Uh, so I think Singapore is probably sliding a bit that way. Singapore is still a pretty vital place and a lot of uh, very smart people love to live in Singapore and make money, think big thoughts, work hard. Uh, China. China's tougher case. Obviously, they uh, have decided to use all this data to really bring people into the fold. That's been a communist thing for a long time, right? The Russians did a lot of that because they're worried about the way that the sort of lure of democracy, which they feel is fatal in the end, but is a lure, up upsets where they're headed. Uh, it's troubling. But we couldn't live that way. But you know, it's interesting, if, if we created the world, and we, right now we de define the groups in the world as the democracies and the autocracies, and that's sort of how we divide it. If we created, said that the groups in the world are those countries which brought their people out of poverty, we and China would feel like, well, we're pretty much the same kind of place. In terms of coming out of poverty, a pretty good job. We did it in the Industrial Revolution, they're doing it now. So, it's an interesting problem, and a lot of young people think the bargain's worth it. Kazakhstan, I get my health care, I get to work, a little quiet on the political thing, it's a good life. So I think, I think the future is not going to be uh, as democratic as we all want it to be, because it's an inefficient system, it's having trouble leading, 
and it's being put to the test. Next question. Yes, sir. I haven't been in Kazakhstan in a while, but I have been there three times. Uh, the, uh, uh, I'm, I'm curious. Uh, they have a, a, a population that a great deal of the population was Ukrainian that I knew that were the Russian part. Hmm. And, and the Kazakhs are, there, are kind of a, a homogeneous group that are similar to the Uyghurs, but they, they're, yeah. they're different. Yeah. Um, and our society is not. Our society is a very diverse group of people from mm. a great number of uh, parts of the yeah. world. The Han Chinese mm. are, are dominant, and therefore yeah. the I've, I've spent a lot of time with Tibetans who want to be very involved in the Chinese economy. They're very interested in in participating and making sure their children know. Uh, uh, Mandarin Chinese, uh, but with our diversity, uh, the how would you say that you you get any kind of consensus in uh, <laughs> the United States as far as adopting yeah. uh, a, a just an educational system? Mm -hmm. yeah. I think the gentleman's point uh, is that Kazakhstan is a small, homogeneous country, and uh, we are much more diverse in this country, and obviously much, much larger. And mm -hmm. the, because it works for Kazakhstan, does that mean necessarily that, we, that it will work yeah. here? Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting. Uh, a lot of the places I described as doing quite well, Sweden, Finland, uh, Singapore, seven million people in each of those countries. That's like New York City. So uh, seven million seems to be a nice number for creating a fairly good economic system. There's 325 million, obviously harder. But Kazakhstan, as I recall, 29 million people. South Korea, X number is pretty large. So th walking your way up the ladder, these larger countries uh, beginning to learn how to operate. Now, they're, they're not as diverse, but Again, it depends a little bit on what you, well, first, there's ways that we're similar that don't relate to diversity. They become more democratic, we're fairly democratic, uh, so that makes us alike, even though South Korea is, again, very much homogeneous. Uh, what do you do with our diversity? Well, originally, we thought, at least, it was that we all identified with uh, freedom, democracy, uh, et cetera. If you're beginning to read a set of histories that say actually, even at the revolution, it was 13, there were 13 cultures, not quite the colonies, and you can see them still playing out in America. There's a good book out on that, I can't remember the name. But their claim is this, this diversity goes deep in us, yet we managed for a while to sense that we were all in this together. The wars do a good job of helping that happen. Uh, that's a kind of hard way to get consensus. So I, I think I lean your way. I think we have trouble figuring out how to meld all this together. Uh, but I'd offer some of these challenges we're facing, climate, work, uh, future of the virtual world, may give us uh, both a compulsion to figure out how to get together, and secondly, maybe a place at the metaverse to work on living together uh, and seeing how that works. I think young kids will, young kids don't share as much of the view of diversity as many of us do. They're much more tolerant of all kinds of diversity that may lead to a certain kind of unity also. In a virtual environment, you can make anything work. It's, it's similar to fiction, maybe even science fiction mm -hmm. and movies in the pre-metaverse era. Um, when you when you get down to it, though, it we're not sure whether it really will represent reality. Yeah, it won't. And and that's an important question when you start to do it to test things. Yeah. And also at the end of the day, um, 
people are going to have to eat, stay warm, um, et cetera. And how does the metaverse deliver on that? Yeah. Well, the, the nice question, and I agree. The, the metaverse doesn't feed you, and it doesn't keep you warm. Uh, it doesn't give you a place to sleep. So you got to come back to the physical world for that. But we do a lot of things which are intellectual, which sort of rise above uh, the physical world. I mean, we do Zoom calls, right? And we talk to each other, and that's real work. We exchange ideas. So a good bit of our life lives up in this next echelon. So the metaverse is even stronger. Uh, I don't, the, first, it's not entirely a fictional world. I'll give you an example. Uh, there's a game. Men and women are playing it. And a woman feels that one of the avatars is coming up and basically beginning to uh, push in and handle her. And she's offended. And she puts it out across the metaverse that she's in. And they create a new rule that says if a woman does, there was a hand signal, does this, the avatar dies and has to move away. So, so in some ways, that's not entirely a fictional world. That's just a new rule set that is applied, and I would predict walks its way back down to the physical world. And we'll start seeing more and more these symbols show up, and the young kids will know what that symbol means. We may not, but they will. The cities you mentioned, uh, mm -hmm. Helsinki, uh, Stockholm, Singapore, are mostly filled with con mostly contented people who, who get the services they need or get enough. <clears throat> what about the places uh, where, which are filled with discontented yeah. people? Let's take the Middle East. <clears throat> it's just 10 years since the Arab Spring hmm. uh, where people voiced their discontent hmm. and took to the streets. <clears throat> and the autocrats, uh, like in Egypt, cracked down to such mm -hmm. an extent they, they turned their countries into prisons. Yeah. <clears throat> what does the metaverse have to offer those countries and, and uh, mm -hmm. also, the, let's say, Western countries trying to help manage <clears throat> the chaos? Yeah. Yeah. Well, first, uh, a lot of the cities that, quote, have contented people, part of the reason they're contented is because they did what I described. That is, they thought about the future. They created an educational system that delivered the goods and gave their people a life that was a good life. So it's not as though they were naturally contented. They built a system t to keep, make people contented. Uh, even you got to say that about a good bit of China. China is not in revolution about the system. There's a lot of contented people. You, politically, you got to watch your lips, but doing business, pretty active. Uh, doing a lot of things, pretty active. So, the uh, but now walk the metaverse. Well, you kind of challenging me. I don't quite know how to use the metaverse to make Egypt better yet. Uh, but uh, I guess I'll keep curiosity on the table. Let's. Uh, <laughs> why don't some of you work on that? It's a good project. Uh, I do think that for young people, like the 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 spring in the Middle East. If young people had better access, more access to a virtual world, there would be more sort of, this is the world we want, this is the world we're going to go after, and maybe these movements get continued life. And that's partly why some of these countries shut down the metaverse, is because they know that's going to be the discussion in the metaverse, which is, why do we live like this? We could live better. I think that'll happen in the U.S. too. I mean, people are going to begin to say, there's a better way to organize society than this. You've noted smart cities, technology, all of these wonderful advances. Um, and the question becomes, what should be our mission of pre-K through 12? Hmm. And who's going to direct the curriculum? What, what and how? Mm -hmm. uh, federal government, uh, private corporations, mm -hmm. loca lo yeah. localities. Who should run that curriculum? What should it be? Thank yeah. you. Well, it, I guess, you know, if we were in Singapore or China, we'd probably try to come up with a singular or somewhat singular view of what ought to happen. In America, in some ways, the nice thing is we're 50 states. They've often been called laboratories of life. Uh, they have diversity. I would capitalize on that and experiment. 
I think we could have more experimentation in some ways in our states than we do, some more diversity to see what works and then match what works. Uh, the other thing that I keep arguing for is to get the neuroscientists who are learning a lot about how the brain holds information together with the K-12 crowd because we're using a model with K-12 which seemed to work for centuries, right? We get born, we go through these evolutionary stages of growing up, and we turn into adults. But now we understand the brain a lot better that maybe we could either compress that evolution, make it faster. We might learn how to do it uh, with the virtual systems instead of always having a teacher, which is lovely to have, but pretty expensive. Once we understood how the brain really worked, and maybe we could do a good bit of our education with those new systems. So I get a lot of science in the, in the game. I get the K-12 system uh, put to the test of saying, uh, show us some models that really work. Well, I can't thank you enough for making me think. Thank you. Um, there are all kinds of ideas that you've thrown out there. But on the whole, I'm very skeptical um, because I see how things have worked out in our city. Um, I'll throw something out. Um, yep. We built a metro, and then we built a light rail, and then we wanted to build another light rail system. And every time we've done that, the number of riders that have taken it have been absolutely um, yeah. much lower than yeah. anything anyone could have yep. anticipated, and yep. the losses of uh, operating it are much greater. Yep. Um, what is the reason for that? I think that comes, you know, I, I've been in Paris, I've been in Barcelona, mm -hmm. love those cities, yep. um, but they can't work in the United States. Yep. Uh, the mm -hmm. primary reason is we have a different conception. What we want is we want to live in large houses, and our, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. our transportation yeah. is, system has been set up with uh, highways to make it sprawl. Yeah. Well, there's no way Baltimore is going to be like uh, Paris. Yeah. I wish it were, but it, there's no yeah. way. Um, but we live in a big house um, that most French could easily uh, um, be jealous of. <laughs> Five families. Right. Uh, I agree with you. Uh, it's, this is a, another speech, but at times uh, I wrote a, a chapter of a book on cities uh, called The Urban Artist, and I pointed out that new cities look really appealing because you can do everything you think and I think we ought to do. The problem is they don't have the vitality and the life that we want to have. You can do old cities and you got the problem the infrastructure is already there and how do you turn it into Paris? Uh, that's hard. But uh, I'm challenging Columbus this way, see what you think. So Columbus is essentially a spokes city. So suburbs, bedroom communities, you primarily work downtown or at Ohio State. So I've said, well, what if there were actually five clusters around Columbus and the center city, each of which was a sort of 15-minute Paris neighborhood? Uh, then you, you can't do that immediately. So you just begin in the process of maybe building bike paths that allow you to get around more. And then you begin to sprinkle retail in. It would probably take 15 years for that to evolve, but could it evolve? Well, city leaders are at least want to talk about it. So maybe uh, I can move Columbus, and by the way, Columbus never did light rail. And, and light rail, the data says, does never pays. This is, this is an ego project that is, does not pay. Uh, buses do pay. We don't like buses that much, but they do pay. Uh, but if you go to the 15-minute neighborhood and you work at home or you work close by, you really get rid of the need to have a spoke system that funnels everyone downtown in the morning, everyone out at night. Uh, so maybe you can get there. It's not easy. I don't want to argue it's easy. Uh, but some of us should try. And this young man in Phoenix, he's trying. You know, he's building a neighborhood that basically says you don't need a car. And you don't need a big house either. Sir, we, uh, we, we thank you very much. Well, my pleasure. Uh,